Hello, everybody. Good morning. Glad you're here. Man, for those of you joining us online, welcome. And as good as you think it might be there and hearing it and seeing it, it is nothing compared to being in person. I have the best seat in the house because right before I come out here, I'm hiding backstage and, and I get to hear everything. It's amazing. Trust me. If you're checking us out online, come check us out in person. You will not regret it. And for those of you who are newcomers, guests here in the house, we hope you'll take us up on the offer and uh, catch us at the guest center. As soon as we're done today, we have a gift for you. It's just a no strings attached way to say thanks for being here. And we are so glad that you are and we're honored that you're with us today. I want to start the message by talking uh, about things that are expected and unexpected. Now, nothing quite fits into that category, I think, quite like the weather. You know, it, I grew up in North Texas, and that means I lived in Tornado Alley. So, you know, so you, you moan and groan, you're like, oh, I don't want that. Like. But for me, that was normal. Every thunderstorm, it was like, well, is Daddy going to tell us to go, you know, hide out in the bathroom till the storm passes? Because there's an unexpected nature to it. You don't quite know if every thunderstorm is going to make a tornado. And, the weird, and, that's, and it's expected that you're going to have them, especially in summer. What's unexpected about tornadoes is, I mean, you can just watch it swirling in the sky and it never does anything. You can watch them touch down and just wreck half a town and they'll just jump right over your street. It is the creepiest, weirdest thing to watch these things. And then, uh, as the Lord would have a sense of humor, he moves our family from Tornado Alley to North Mississippi, which had tornadoes. And so I was in high school, and I'm like, I know how to deal with this. But it's different in North Mississippi because it's a cold weather tornado. It's a strange thing. And so then I think I'm done with my weather unexpectedness, and the Lord sends me to New Orleans, Louisiana, where I met Patty. Now, what does, what does New Orleans, Louisiana deal with as weather? Hurricanes. Now, hurricanes are really fun. See, you see these bad boys coming. I mean, these people in the Gulf Coast are, like, weird. See, I thought people like, in my part of the country were, no, they're, they're not strange. I mean, they see these things coming from weeks off. They can see a low-pressure system developing out there, and they see that thing go in the Gulf. And meteorologists, get this, meteorologists on the Gulf Coast of the United States, they're, they're celebrities. Because these people can tell you where the storm is going to go, and they'll measure the low pressure and the heat of the Gulf, and they'll tell you exactly where it's going to end up. And then these crazy people in the city of New Orleans, they'll watch if they're on the east side or the west side of the storm, because one's the really bad wet side, and the other side is meh, it's not a big deal. And, they, and, they, and, and to, in that degree, it's very expected. You can predict it. You know, relatively, nowadays especially, they can get you pretty close to where these things are going to land. It is really remarkable how expected they are. And there's a lot of predictability to it. Now, that's just one area in our lives where we have things that are expected and very unexpected. But if you've ever been to an award ceremony, or maybe you've watched an award show on television, if anybody ever watches those anymore... Someone gets an award, and, and it's, it's expected for them to give an acceptance speech. And it's, it's expected for them to give thanks for all the people that got them there. And the bigger the award, the more people they tend to thank. You know, That's expected. What's unexpected is if they get up there and they don't thank anybody. Like That makes the news because it is so unexpected that they don't say thank you to somebody. Now, as disciples of Jesus, as followers of the Lord, we have so much to be thankful for. That's expected. It's expected for us to say, wow, thank you, Lord, you've blessed me so much. When you look at what he's given us, he's given us eternal life. He's given us our church family. He's given us joy in the journey. He's given us a peace that the world doesn't give. It's expected that we would return that back to him in gratitude. What's unexpected is when we don't. What's unexpected is when we live like functional atheists. We live as if God isn't blessing us. We live in these kind of weird, grumpy lives and sometimes we kind of go, well, I don't have a reason to be thankful. We may not say it, but then we act it. And that's unexpected. So as we entered into the series, The Art of Gratitude, we're talking about these, these areas in our lives that we need to really get good at showing gratitude for. Because in just two days, if you're not paying attention to the calendar, November 1st is here. That's like the month of gratitude. You know, I love it because as a culture, we've kind of stretched out Thanksgiving into the whole month. And not only do I love the food, I love the fact that we get to talk about gratitude. and We get to remind ourselves to be thankful. And it's an art form. There is an art to this. It's a science and an art. But I think it's more art that we just get comfortable with saying thank you. 
And so today we're going to start out the one that deserves all the thanks, and that's God. Because at the end of those acceptance speeches, people tend to kind of give a token, and I thank God for this. Or when the storm passes over and it doesn't destroy our house, we go, oh, thank God. But are we really aware of what we're saying? Or is it just a word that we're saying? Is it just a vocalized pause and we could be saying, oh, thank God? Or do we really mean thank the God of heaven and earth who gave me everything I have? See, there's a difference. Same word, very different meaning. We're in the book of James to talk about this. James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verses 13 through 17. I highly encourage you to look it up in your own Bible, print or electronic. I do not care. Just I encourage you to get into the Bible so that it gets into you. If you need to borrow a print Bible in front of you, it's page 825. And if you don't own a print Bible of your own and you'd like one, or maybe you want to take one and give it to a friend or a family member or slip it on a co-worker's desk, take them. That's fantastic. Clean us out. We'll replace them all magically by next week, okay? Nothing makes me happier than seeing cases of Bibles come in. But it's page 825 there. Words are also going to be on the screens so you can follow along. But I really want you to see this for yourself. And I love James as a book. It's one of the reasons that we recommend this to new believers because James is so just practical. I mean, he is just so like walk out your faith. It's so, but it's just, it punches you every time too. I just love the way he approaches it. And I love even James's backstory because James, we know this guy named James. We go, well, who is this guy? I have an older brother named James. He's named after this guy. Well, who is this James in the Bible? Well, this James in the Bible was the half-brother of Jesus. Half-brother, same moms, different dads. And so this, that means this guy grew up with Jesus. Jesus was his big brother, but he didn't believe in Jesus until after the resurrection, like all the rest of Jesus' brothers and sisters. And so it was after the resurrection that James and the rest believe in Jesus and recognize he's the one they've been waiting for and he's the Savior of the world. And so James gets it and he gets it good. I mean, he just I mean, he becomes a pillar in the early church, so much so that when he writes under the Holy Spirit's inspiration, of course, but he writes and all the churches pay attention to it because this is James. This is the elder James. This is the James who was there when Jesus was a kid. This was James. And James comes at this in a very, like I said, on-the-nose kind of way. And he hits some pretty tough subjects, and he does it in a very practical sense. That's why I just love the book of James so much. But as you follow along, James chapter 1, verses 13 through 17, here's what he writes. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows." Now, verse 13 begins right at the beginning, reminding us that we can be thankful because the Lord's holy. He's holy. And James comes right up front and he says, when someone is tempted, we should not say, God is tempting me. Why? He is incapable of tempting us because he is not evil. There is no evil in him at all. So when we say God is holy and we start start trying to define that, we realize really quickly that's actually a hard concept to define. So when we say the word holy, what we mean is holy means to be set apart or to be sanctified, or to be made holy, but that doesn't help us because that's using the word in the definition. It means to be completely separated in such a way that now you're usable by God. So when we say God is holy, we're saying He is completely and 100% set apart and set separately from sin. He is separated from His creation. He is so perfectly holy that the beings of heaven are literally on fire in his presence. And oftentimes fire is used to to explain his holiness. It is a searing perfectionism. It is searingly perfect. We don't have a concept of that because we're not holy. But this is how we're describing God. We're using this term, and when James says God is holy, he is incapable of being evil. Which means the gifts that he gives us, the things that he does, they're not evil. And James is actually confronting a a bad, weird theology of his day that we still fight today, and that is, where did evil come from? In his day, there were were groups of, uh, of Jewish people that thought that evil came from God, and that God gave us evil just like he gave us good. And James is going, not at all, God is holy, he is incapable of doing these things. 
So because we can acknowledge he's holy, we can also acknowledge the fact that we're not. We're not holy, at least not by ourselves. That we're, we're not like God at all. Not in that regard. We are incapable of being holy in the way that he is holy. And in verses 14 and 15, we have this progression where James is talking about that this desire gives birth to sin. Sin, when it's all grown up, produces death. That's the metaphor he uses is this natural childbirthing, raising, growing up process. Now, the Apostle Paul uses a different metaphor to say the same thing. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the first phrase, he says, the wages of sin is death. Different metaphors, same idea. That the evil in the world is in us. We are the source of the evil. We are the ones who desire that which we don't have. We're the ones that want to grab that which isn't ours. We're the ones who lie, cheat, and steal. That's not from God. That's already in us. And so then when temptation comes along, we already want it. We're so broken that we don't even reach out to God. That we're so messed up that we do everything to run from him. How many times have we heard that story, even among you and me, where we say, I've tried everything else, and then finally I just gave up and tried God. Why do we do that? Because inside of us, we're so broken. We just run from the very source of life. We run away from the very being who is capable of doing something because we're not holy, and we know it, and we know that we're broken. And we know that in and of ourselves, there is no good that we can do. And we know that the only thing, as an old theologian said, the only thing we contribute to our salvation is the sin that makes it necessary. That's what we put into the equation. So we acknowledge that God's holy and we're not. But then this, in his holiness, get this, the Lord gives us reasons for gratitude. So now, with that in mind, how James is coming at this, God's holy, we're not. Nothing evil comes from him. God is not tempting us. It's in us. Now, let's read verses 16 and 17 again. So he says, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. So he's talking to Christians here. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. So like I said, there was this strange theology in his day where people thought if something evil came to into my life, that God was the source of the evil. Now, there's a nuance here where God does leverage things in our lives. God will sometimes use our own bad decisions to bring about his discipline. We've talked about that. He does that. But that's, that's one thing to say God uses something as opposed to saying God is the originator of something. Even today, there are Christian groups who will look you right square in the eye and say evil originates with God. And James is saying, no. 2,000 years ago, he's saying, no, evil does not come from God. He is incapable of doing that. Evil comes from us. Everything that is good comes from him. Everything that is morally upright comes from him. Everything that makes us smile comes from him. You know, one crazy thing that happened in my life since our treadmill, you know, died, thanks 2020, um, is that I have to walk outside now, okay? I have to walk in, and I walk in the mornings before the sun ever comes up. Now, you non-morning people, you don't understand this, but there's a time of day the sun is not up yet, and it's like the sky is dark, and there are stars up there, like these little bitty suns a long way off, and they're tiny, but they make little shapes in the sky. We call them constellations, okay? So all you non-morning people, now you're with me. As I'm trucking along, sometimes I just stop, and I look up, and I'm like, wow. There's not many places in town you can go and not have light, but there's a few spots there in our neighborhood that, like, all the lights are burned out or something, and so I can, it's probably not safe now that I think about it, but I look up, and I'm like, I can see all these stars, and I just think of that passage that says, the heavens declare the glories of God. In every which direction I look, I just see stars after star after star. And it makes me smile. Why? Because every good thing is from God. Amen. Everything that makes us smile is from Him. That that's part of what He's done to say, look, look at the beauty. And I get to see the sun before, you know, we get close to the time change. When I get back in summer, I, I watch the sun start coming up. And the sky becomes this like brilliant, like cotton candy color. And then, that, then the purple right at the edge, and then it gives way to just the beginning of the red and the yellows on the horizon. And I'm like, wow, you painted another one. Wow. I mean, it's just every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights who doesn't shift. He doesn't change like shifting shadows. He's not hiding himself. He's saying, here I am. Here I am. He doesn't have to hide. He's holy. We read the first part of Romans 6, 23. Here's the whole verse. Paul the Apostle writes, the wages of sin is death. We saw that. 
but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, that's the ultimate gift. That's the ultimate good thing God is giving us. He gives us eternal life. He gives us this gift, this gift that we cannot earn, that we can't do anything to contribute to. God just doesn't look at us and go, yeah, you're a pretty good human. Here's eternal life. So where it talks about that, there's nothing holy in us. We're so broken. That's why it's grace. Because what we deserve is hell. That's where unholy things go, and we're not holy. So in and of ourselves, that's what we deserve. We deserve God's condemnation. We deserve His judgment. We deserve everything bad because only perfect people go to heaven, because only God can be around perfection. That's why it's a gift. He gives it to us that, that Jesus took our place on the cross and he, he became sin so that we can become like him and that when God the Father looks at us as his disciples, he doesn't see us as these filthy, rotten, dirty sinners who are bound for hell. He sees us through the blood of his son and he sees us as holy. You ever thought about that? The Father looks at you as his child and says you're holy. Not because you don't sin anymore, but because he sees you through his son. He sees you through the blood of Jesus. That's why it's so important. That's why James is saying, how could we possibly say that God is evil and that he visits evil to us and that he gives evil on us and he cur- No, that the good things we have, the eternal life that we have in him, these are all the things from God. Because what we deserve is hell. But what he chooses to give us is heaven. That's grace. That's mercy. He doesn't give us what we deserve. He gives us what we don't deserve because of his holiness and because of his love. And so we turn that back to him as as a moment where we center our mind's attention and our heart's affection on him, which is the definition of worship, centering our mind's attention and our heart's affection on him, which means what we do is when we worship him, we are are giving him an expression of gratitude. That worship is an expression of gratitude. It's a way of saying thank you, thank you. Thank you. And, and worship is not just music. Worship is me in the morning, chugging and out there in the cold, you know, in the sweatpants, trying to work up a sweat, looking at the sky and going, wow, thank you. This is beautiful. Your handiwork is amazing. To see all of you, to see your faces, to hear your laugh. I love being out in the lobby and just hearing you talk humanity. And I'm like, wow, God, look at all this beautiful tapestry of color and personality and histories you have woven together into this church family. Wow. Worship's not just music. Worship is, is expressing, expressing our gratitude to God. It's centering our mind's attention and heart's affection on Him. It's expressing our gratitude. It's saying, thank God, not as a flippant token, but truly from our heart saying, thank you. Thank you for those good gifts that you've given me. I love this passage that Paul writes in 1 Corinthians. I, I absolutely adore this passage. I just, man, you're going to get it in a minute. First, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, Paul writes this. Or do you not know? Now, he's writing that in a way that he's assuming the answer is, well, yeah, we do know this, okay? Oh, do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? That's the nice way of saying sinners, okay? He says this, do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Check this out. He calls them on the carpet. And that is what some of you were. Were is the operative word. That, but you were washed You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. If that is not reason to give him praise, I don't know what is. To know that this is what I was. I was the filthy, rotten sinner. I was the one that didn't deserve his love, and then he lavished it on me, and by his Spirit cleaned me up. How can I not say thank you? How can I not live a life of thanks? The psalmist in the Old Testament sings this in Psalm 84, verses 10 and 11. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold 
from those whose walk is blameless. Now, how do we have a blameless walk? That's what the Lord does to us. He, he makes us holy even though we're not yet. We're not home. I love how the old preacher said this one time. He said, don't judge me yet. I'm still in the oven and God is not done cooking. I love that. Because I'm, I'm holy, but yet I'm not completely there yet. But God calls you holy, and he calls me holy. But, but I'm, he, he's not done baking yet. I'm not done in the oven. This isn't the final version yet. He's still working. A little kid's song. He's still working on me to make me everything I ought to be. Worship is an expression of gratitude. And when we think about worship as an expression of gratitude, that can be both expected and unexpected. Because if we think about what God has done, if we think about the fact that we deserve hell, we deserve that, that we are the bad people. As Paul said, we were those people that did all those things. And yet God has lavished grace on us. He's cleaned us up. He's given us eternal life. He's made us his own. He, he's creating a, play, a place for us. And when everything is ready, he's going to call us home to be with him. We think of everything he's done. It would be expected to return that back as a life of worship. That's expected. What's unexpected is when we don't. Because now we're forgetting what he's done. Now we're forgetting what we were. Now we're forgetting what he's called us to be. And one thing I do if I'm feeling down in the dumps, which believe it or not does happen. Sometimes on those walks, I'll get a little... Eh, those are the moments that, that my brain kicks back in, overrides my heart, and I start just saying, oh, thank you, Lord, for this beautiful sky. Thank you for the ability to move. Thank you for warm clothing. Thank you for heaters. Thank you for a smooth sidewalk. Thank you for that bump on the sidewalk because it reminds me to pick up my feet. Thank you for very comfortable walking shoes. I just start, start just thanking him. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. It's exactly what I'll do. I'll just thank him for everything I can think of, and I'm telling you within like two minutes, my whole attitude's changed. I'm smiling, and I just feel this lightness in my heart. I don't know how to describe it any other way. If you've not experienced it, you don't know, but there's just this, this I wouldn't say exuberance necessarily, but there's just a lightness and a joy that's there when I go, wow, you really have given me so much. Wow. And then usually I kind of finish that out by saying, Lord, I'm, I'm sorry that I forgot all that. I forgot that it was your air that I'm breathing that it's your systems that are converting the carbon dioxide coming out of my mouth back into oxygen so I can breathe. Thank you. That's just amazing. And I, and I wanna, I've said this to you before. I've encouraged you to do this before, and I will keep encouraging you until I have no more breath to do it. Pray prayers of gratitude every now and again, and just thank the Lord for all those things he's given you. Lord, thank you for my family. Thank you for my work. Thank you that I have a job. Thank you that I have somewhere to go. Thank you that I can go. Whatever is happening here, just open your eyes and look around left and right to be thankful. And just pray to the Lord and just thank him for that. I'm telling you, it will change your outlook. It will change how you view situations. When you realize you have been given so very much, and so have I, we've all been given so very much. We have so much to be thankful for. One custom around here that we do, we started on our vision celebration dinner, and it goes all the way through the end of November, is this gratitude pumpkin we, we talk about. Every year it looks a little different, but this gratitude pumpkin, it sometimes is small, little pumpkins that have been on tables. It's been one big, massive pumpkin. This year it is the biggest pumpkin of all because it's what we've been putting our candy in for the trunk or treat, <laughs> which you've been great. You've filled that thing up multiple times. We just keep emptying it. Okay, oh, you keep putting candy in. But then it got converted. Now it's this gratitude pumpkin. And you've seen some of the, uh, the just have people have written things they're grateful for. I want to really encourage you to do that. And it's not just something we're putting on video announcements. This is something we do because it is a symbol of our gratitude. It is something we do just to, I think we do it every year, just to remind people to be grateful. Show it, write it out. And you're, you're thanking the Lord for this. Some people have written uh, their family. Some will write their job. Some write new jobs. Some write, I don't work at that old place anymore, and they're grateful for that. Maybe they're thankful. <laughs> One year someone wrote on there, I'm thankful that I only see my extended family once a year. <laughs> Who am I to judge? If you're grateful, praise the Lord. I mean, I don't know your situation. But, I mean, just, just do that because when people come through, you will be blessed by reading what they write. And every year we watch these pumpkins, big or small, we, we watch them just black out with all the ink 
And that's a big challenge with that big, massive paper mache pumpkin out there. But what an incredible symbol of gratitude if we get that thing blacked out with ink, with all the gratitude. And you don't have to wait for an invitation. If you happen to swing by there, write something down. You know, I'm thankful for all the Halloween candy. You know, I'm thankful for all the candy sales that are going to happen. Whatever. It doesn't, we think sometimes we've got to be so fancy. Yes, we're grateful for eternal life. Yes, of course, and we have to express that. But it's okay to also be thankful for the little things in life too, for sunrises, for being able to gather. May we never take that for granted ever, ever again. I mean, we, we did this even back in 2020. And y'all, that was a hard year to find gratitude, and we still blacked out every pumpkin we had. God has been so good. And when we worship Him, we're centering our mind's attention and our heart's affection on Him. And worship is an expression of our gratitude. And James is telling us, don't forget all these good things that we have from eternal life, the big one, down to the little bitty things that make us smile. Those are gifts from our Heavenly Father. So don't ever just kind of flippantly say, thank God. Think about that and really deeply thank God for those things.